What's up, man? It's Connect Nessie. Please bench Hey, what's up, Brian? How are you? Good, man. How are you doing? Good, 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 good. What's going on? How, how are things in Arkansas? Man, things are, are great. Um, for me personally and Cora, everything's going great. Um, we, we're like surging in COVID cases. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, everywhere is. I mean, L.A., we're, we're the highest we've been since this whole thing has started. L.A.'s nuts, you know? We, you know, for as sp- I know we have some big cities, and you do too, but for as spread out as we are, we had a few. We're still very, have some very rural areas, but we had some 3,000-a-day cases that wow. had been the highest numbers. I, and <clears throat> I thought that was high as well. I mean, that's the highest numbers we've seen the whole time. But... Uh, Cora had it. My parents have it right now, but they're doing okay. Um, right. Good, you know, good, good. Glad to hear. I, I'm sure you do too. I mean, I know so many people that have had it. I've been around people that had it and didn't get it. it yeah, yeah. Maybe I had it was asymptomatic. It's it's so wild. I've been the same way. We've had a lot of people have it here. Um, two of my friends passed away from it. Um. One of them was a guy that I took care of. Uh, I was kind of a caretaker for. He's uh, in a wheelchair um, and uh, lived alone. And so I was one of the one of his caretakers. And so I would go over every night and put him in bed and and uh, hang out with him, put him in bed and whatnot. And anyways, he ended up being positive. And um, um, uh, when he when he uh, when he ended up being positive, his home nurse who used to come during the day, the nurse the company stopped sending their nurse. So he had no nurse coming. And so I would go in and I would, I would, uh, I would get him out of bed. I'd clean him up, get him out of bed, get him in his wheelchair. And, uh, finally, like, um, finally, when he started to show a few more symptoms, I was like, Hey man, like, cause he lived alone. Right. I said, let's, uh, we got to get you to the VA and get you to the VA because if, if, it, if this starts to go South, it can go really South on, you know, and, uh, and you live alone. So I, I ended up taking him to the VA. They admitted him. Um, he ended up, he ended up passing away in the hospital, you know? Um, but, uh, but I've never had it that I know of, you know what I mean? Like, and I've, I've never shown any symptoms. I've never, so I don't know, man, it's really weird. It is. It's which I guess all, all, many viruses are, I mean, I'm not, uh, a virologist or right, 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 right. Whatever right. that other one, uh, epid- epidemiologist. Epidemiologist, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I always botch the pronunciation of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, it is. Uh, you know, I it just really blows my mind that Cora had it and I didn't get it, and I was uh, quarantined with her, took care of her. I mean, because she had right. all the symptoms. Right, uh, right, right. And I, the one of the weirdest symptoms that I thought was she had this like rash on the insides of her fingers really hey, <laughs> yeah i was uh, on top of everything else loss of taste and smell is also odd yeah. and that lingered for like a month oh so, wow yeah it's uh but i did not get it and then um i was exposed one other time and and got a negative test and didn't get it then either so <clears throat> It's kind of that's what blows my mind. Like maybe I was an asymptomatic carrier, which is also another mind blowing thing about it. Right, 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 right. Maybe, maybe. What, what's your? Do you know your blood type? What's your blood type? I don't know. Yeah, I just I've been getting. Uh, as I do blood every six months now since yeah. I'm third. Since I, I saw your comment on my forty eight year old post. Oh yeah. <laughs> but, so I, yeah. I get wellness checkups now. But right, uh, right. <clears throat> next time I, I've got a, I have no idea what my blood type is. I know Cora's, she's um, O, uh, type O. Oh, neck. okay. Yeah. But she's so, O neg, huh? Okay. She's, yeah, she's the one that they said it's not supposed to be hit. It's hard. And she was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm O positive. Okay. I'm O positive. And I, and like I said, I've been around it. I've been around it quite a bit and I've never, never, one of two things, either, either, you know, they, they've, uh, they've done some studies and they've traced cases of it. Um, as early as I want to say uh, uh, October, November of uh, of um, 2019 here in LA, mm. um, 
they've gone back and they've checked blood, uh, donated blood from like the Red Cross, and they've found antibodies and in, in, in what's it called. So they, they know that people as early as uh, around uh-huh. October, November 2019 have had, have had it. I know that I was sick in December and I was, it was really weird. It wasn't like anything, um, it wasn't like anything crazy, but I was down for about three weeks, man. Like just, just kind of, just kind of had the crud, man. Like with just low energy, low. And I finally, I finally shook it. So like one of two things, either, either my, my blood type is the, is the resistant type, or I may have had it back then. I don't know. I haven't done an antibody test, but, um, uh, me and my, my partner here at the gym, uh, her and I, we get tested regularly. Um, you know, uh, about every two weeks we get tested and we've never had a positive test. So, you know, who knows? Yeah. I mean, it's real. Don't get me wrong. I know it's real, man. And I know people have it. And like I said, I have, I've had two friends that pass away from it, but it's just, it's just really strange, man. It's kind of, you know, and, um, it's, it's interesting if we're ever going to get back to normal, you know, um, even with the vaccine, I don't know if we're ever going to get back to normal. So. You know, yeah. No, how I was mean, it, it, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. How how has it affected business for you? You guys doing okay? Yeah, we really are. That was one thing I was gonna. Ch- we'll chat about that right now. Like for okay. us, we eh, initially we had like maybe forty freezes on memberships, maybe even fifty. Yeah. Like there was a big wave of of freezes. We were closed from March sixteenth until May fourth entirely. Okay. Like, right. I mean um there might have been some secret open mats you know right right just a couple right (laughs) (laughs) but you know then we opened back up Uh, pretty much every single person turned their membership back on right and then we actually have been surging since then because two weeks before the pandemic hit we moved to twice the size location yeah 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 Mm -hmm. so we're still not even running the schedule that we want to be running Right, right. Entirely, we were going to offer. We're we're getting there, right? Uh, right. But we also are being um, it, being somewhat cautious with yeah how much how many people we have in the coming and going and stuff, right? Cause sure, sure, sure. Classes at once, pretty much all evening. So, but you know, so things have been surging since we reopened uh, in terms of people coming in, training. Um, enrollments of new memberships and stuff like that um so everything with that is just headed it been in a positive direction we actually have more members than ever uh, right. by a lot uh, like right. uh, yoga really uh, is probably quadrupled for us since we moved nice nice so we were doing that a couple of years before we moved and now we have it right. like its own room and uh, right do hot yoga and it's been and then we closed for a week when Cora had COVID and uh 10 days something like that I mean she got it on like a Thursday so we closed like right. there and I think we reopened on the following Tuesday the right so week and then that next so but I mean other than just those two little hiccups of like the bad timing of closing after we moved and yeah uh, and then closing for another week but I mean almost all the instructors have had it right um, and the, I mean, I haven't had it. A, a one other instructor I know hasn't had it that's here every day. And hopefully we don't get it. And hopefully even if, you know, even if I do get it, we don't have to, um, you know, unless there's a, a, a big exposure, we don't have to close down. We're going to be closed until just after the new year. Um, right. Right. Or tomorrow. So. Right. Yeah. Give us a little huh. time. Well, it sounds like you guys are doing good. You're making it. So that's always a good thing. You know, it's been yeah. a crazy year. How has how's it affected you? We're in, are you still in Hollywood? Yeah. I am not. We moved out of Hollywood last year. We opened at our new location in October of last year. Okay. So okay. we were October, November, December, January, February. So we were open, what, uh, five months when we got shut down? Um, yeah, October. Uh, let's see. We opened October 1st. So October, November. October, November, December, January, February. Yeah, so we were open. We were open five months. We got shot that shut down. I mean, so technically, um, we've been closed, shut down longer than we were actually open. You know, um, so we we were got shut down in March, um, and then uh, we re back we reopened probably around May, probably around the same time you did, um, and then they shut us down again. But we uh, 
we just decided to stay open, man. Yeah. So we've uh, like every jujitsu academy here in Los Angeles, the majority of us, are, our front windows are all closed up. We bring everybody through the back door, and we've been kind of uh, kind of playing that game for a while. Um, uh, maybe a couple months ago, two about two months ago, um, just like you guys, we had a huge surge of new students. Man, people were calling like crazy, you know, and um, and I kept telling our, our girl here who helps out. I kept telling her, I said, hey, be real careful. You like kind of vet them as much as you can if they're calling, asking if we're open, you know, and and she did a great job. And and we man, we we got a ton of new members over the last couple months. Um, we're not back up to where we were um, originally, but, uh, but we're doing well. Um, and, um, uh, and then this last wave, things have kind of slowed down for us a little bit. We still have all the members, nobody's quit. Nobody's frozen their, their accounts or anything like that. They just haven't been showing up for class, you know, just kind of, and, and it may be the holidays, you know, that's always kind of gets like that about around the holidays. But when we've had this last big surge, we noticed that people started, you know, slowing down we still offer uh, we still offer people uh the opportunity to uh to zoom in and so um so like over the, these last couple of weeks a lot of people have been zooming in to watch class um instead of coming in to participate so mm-hmm. yeah but we're doing pretty good yeah man i've talked about this a little bit with people uh in passing but I think we're all gonna, on the other side of this, uh, are gonna make some cool evolutions in how we do things. I, I know I am with how, like I teach at a college now. Um, right. And with what I'm going to leverage my studio here, there's a the um, there's like a separate uh, suite, I guess you could say, off of the new gym. That's where our podcast studio is at, right? Right, awesome. But, um, I've been, ever since we closed down last March, I've been sort of leveraging like, okay, the digital need is never going to go away. You know, I've got to create more stuff in all for my podcast. How can I use that for my history classes I teach at the university? And uh, can I have a podcast with Mark Bradford and then put it up and then my students, you know, it's, it's all connected. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, but I think that that's like a, it is a silver lining. I think that we're going to um, we're going to be able to uh, meet meet some demands of like, hey, you know, like you want to do as I've done several Zoom private lessons with Jack Toffer since uh, oh really since the pandemic began, you know, and it's yeah. like that's not anything we had ever done before, right, right. And then now I'm like, I wonder who else offers digital private you know right, right, i mean right, right. It, that's me as a, a black belt in another state like is that something sure. that is um gonna be marketable i i talked with uh sambo steve and he was like there's no way i would never do that you know and i was right, like right, right but there's that perspective too and and he's like i need in his reasoning was on point he's like i need to be able to like you get do the technique you feel that you know kind of yeah. approach so you know the the interesting thing is but that's him and and there's so many people in this world and we all learn differently right and um i will tell you we have one girl here that um that zoomed in religiously she zoomed in like she was doing really good and then uh she's a school teacher so when we shut down she was like well i'm just gonna i'm just gonna zoom in Uh, i'm gonna try to limit my contact with people um so she would zoom in religiously and I would watch her on, on Zoom. I would watch her with her dummy. She had a dummy and I would watch her do her techniques and I'd correct what I could. And then um, when things started to ease up, she came back in here and she was training and I was watching her during rolling and, and I watched her hit a couple really nice arm bars and arm bar triangle um, combinations. And I was like, holy crap, man, like that looks really good. Like, what have you, you know? And she said, man, just off of Zoom. So we all learn differently, man. And we can all excel. I mean, that, that she found that that works really well for her. And, uh, and um, she can't be the only one out there, right? There's a lot of other people out there just like her. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a combo thing. I think about like the, the multiple intelligences model all the time, if you're familiar with that, of like some people are going to benefit um, solely for their learning style by like that feel and touch maybe sure, sure. That, that Sambo Steve is about it, you know? Yeah. Um, for me, 
it's this right here. Like, Hey, Whoa, I see that. I see what you're showing there. We're having a, a conversation about it. You're explaining it to me. I'm a very right. like see and hear kind of learner, right? An audio. Right, 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 right. Sure. Some people you could just say it like uh, in a very philosophical, reasonable way, rational learning. Right. Now, I'm a little bit on that side too, I think. But uh, the jujitsu is all those, all, all of yeah, them. yeah, 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 right. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's been the, that's been the probably one of the neatest things over the years that I've been teaching. Right, is being to uh, being able to identify what type of learner my student is, um, and then uh, and then uh, uh, being able to communicate them communicate to them the things I need them to do. Right, um, I, I've always been lucky. I've always been very visual. So I can watch somebody do a technique and I can go right out there and replicate it or imitate them. And uh, I've been very visual. And so I, I, I've always been lucky that way. But I know that there are a lot of students out there that that uh, that aren't. It's And you can identify them right off the bat because you, you do the move, you do the move and you demonstrate it three or four times. You ask everybody if they have it. Everybody says yes. And then you go out there. And they're grabbing the wrong arm. They're doing, you're like, dude, were you even watching me? And then you, then you go, wait a second. This guy is obviously not a visual learner. You know what I mean? So we got to go back and, and, you know, and move him around a little bit. He's probably more kinesthetic, move him around, you know, take his hand, put it here, whatnot. And he's got to feel it for himself. Um, but that's been, that's been like, that's been one of the joys, if you will, of, 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 of teaching over the years is understanding that and being able to identify that in my students and, uh, you know, um, and, uh, and I've always kind of prided myself on being able to identify it. And then, uh, and then, um, like I said, communicate it to them in a way they, they understand it. So, you know, yeah, Here, here's a funny, uh, full circle story on, uh, on that. So like, and I, I told John and a, a couple of the guys here at the gym that they came to, that have trained with, came to your seminar when you came down. So we've been doing butterfly guard, right? Right. So this will be a testament to my learning style again, right? So you were doing a private lesson with John Brashear, this guy just got a just got promoted to black belt recently, actually. Right. And you were showing him a butterfly sweep, right? But you were like, uh, you, you were the import of this one detail for us that I've now been teaching when we've been doing this this butterfly and Marcelo style techniques and stuff uh, about like do like when you go for the butterfly sweep using the <clears throat> the opposite leg like digging your toe into the mat oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Five toe. like we imported that but here's where like john was like oh i forgot yeah that's where i got that because i told him i was like hey i'm doing a podcast with mark he's the guy who told us how to do that for the first time but i i saw you tell john that i was sitting over to the side you did like three privates uh, right. with some of my students like the day after the seminar before you went back to the airport yeah. or something and i was just watching and you're like, yeah, you know, this when they stand up and they're resisting, you use that toe in the mat and that'll turn you down. I was like, but you know, it was just one right, of those, right. but it was just me seeing you illustrated on him a couple of times. It's like on the edge of the mat. I don't even think I had a gi on. Yeah. You right. got out there working. And I was like, that, but that's just, that was my learning style. And actually, I was like, oh, whoa, I just saw him do that. Wow. It's mine now. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, good times, man. That was, uh, you know, when you taught that seminar, I believe you were talking about how you had just trained with Dave Kama. Is that correct? Maybe. God, is that that long ago? Because I haven't seen one. I saw Dave not too long ago, but, but yeah, I guess, I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. I may have just trained with Dave. Yeah. Was it like your first time training with him? Have you trained with him a little bit over the years? No. So Dave, so here's the funny thing about Dave, man. Um, I love Dave. I love Dave to death. We don't see each other as much as I, I would like. I, I need to keep in contact with him. But um, um, like everybody else that does jiu-jitsu, I was always intrigued with with Hickson, right? Right? Because, you know, the, 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 the myth of Hickson Grace here. I was always intrigued with Hickson. And, and if you ever watch him, if you ever watch him fight, or if you've ever seen him grapple, you obviously know that the guy is super, super talented. And so I've always been intrigued with Hickson. And so I just moved back out here to LA and I was like, well, who are the Hickson black belts out here? Like, who can I work with? Who can I, um, I always, I obviously knew of Henry. Henry was out at dynamics over by Santa Monica or over on Santa Monica Boulevard. And, um, but he was really busy, had his own, had dynamics and was really busy and whatnot. And so I started looking and I, and, um, and then I, I found out about Dave 
And then on a on a on a forum somewhere, somebody said like, oh yeah, he teaches like at a like at a like at a tennis club, you know, down in uh, in Laguna Gal somewhere, you know. And I'm like, man, well, who is this dude? He's teaching out of like this tennis club, you know, this extra room at a tennis club. Somehow, I don't remember how it happened, but somehow I got a hold of his telephone number, you know. So I called him and uh, I said, hey, is this a Dave Kama? And he said, yeah, it is, you know. And I told him, hey, I've been trying to track you down. Um, uh, you know, like, uh, I'm interested in doing a private with you. The funny thing is Dave is so down to earth. Like, he was, surpri- he was genuinely surprised that I knew who he was, right? Yeah. Like, he was like, really? Like, he was genuinely, genuinely just, like, surprised that I knew who he was. And, um, and I said, uh, you know what? I'm interested in doing a private with you. And, uh, and he said, well, well, what belt are you? And I said, well, I'm a black belt. And he was like, He's like, dude, you don't need to do a private with me. He's like, if you're a black belt, you don't need to do a private with me. And I go, no, but I, I really want to, you know? And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He goes, uh, me and a couple of guys train out of my backyard on Saturday mornings at eight o'clock. Um, here's my address. And if you want to come train, come, come down and train. So I was like, man, really? So, so yeah, so I started going down there on Saturday mornings and training with him and his guys for a little while. Um, and yeah, and that's how I met. But he, he was like, super down to earth dude like just uh like i said totally blown away that 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 i knew who he was in the back and that i even wanted to do a private with him you know um but uh but yeah but yeah and then training with dave and then we trained together and then uh and then he showed me a bunch of stuff after we would train he would always you know stop and show me some stuff or go over some concepts with me that was always really cool you know, and so, so yeah, I appreciated the time that I, that I went out there and trained with him. Like I said, it's just gotten to the point now that I don't, uh, um, uh, we just don't see each other enough. And so, you know, have you, have you trained to take a few times over the years? I have not, I've never, I, I've been to two of his seminars. I've been to two of his seminars. Yeah. But I've never trained with him personally. Like I missed out for a while. He was teaching down here on Wednesdays at Crohn's, you know, um, the Wednesday mornings. And I, I meant to go. I just I just never uh, just never got around to it. I mean, you know, it, it, running your own school, you're always so busy, man. It's it's hard for I mean, I'm here now um, and uh, it's hard to get away from it. You know what I mean? So. I mean, I, I'm technically at my school, too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> so, right, yeah, so. it's. Um... Yeah, totally. I, same with me. I had a couple of seminars, but I just like, I remember that why I bring up you train with Dave is because like, I mean, those techniques that like got us onto this conversation, like that, the Hickson's approach to do, right. which, you know, Jack has trained a, a lot with Hickson over the years, trained yeah. with his house, uh, tons of seminars, did classes at Crohn's. And I've trained a ton with Jack. He's done like five seminars at my gym. I've trained with him uh, going to California a time or two. But it is, it's a special type of jujitsu that like, after I trained with Hickson for the first time, like maybe three years after you came in, I was like, whoa, wow. Right. Like it was just this special flavor, man. You know, right. it, it, it really blew me away. I, I was so inspired. I mean, I was like a two stripe brown belt or something. I was, but it just things that like uh, that we were doing were the most white belt things ever. Things, yeah, yeah. What you ca- were kind of saying about you're like this is the stuff that you you learned as a white belt, but you you've been doing it wrong the whole time was kind of the point right. I you're making. But I mean, they like really like like hip throws. Like Hickson did a right. whole bunch of stuff from like that some of that i think some of the gracie stuff might call it the t position i think that's what right right hours people where you just get into the side like his he blew my mind with that i was testing for my judo black belt like a few months after that and i was just like oh i just learned how to do a hip throw wow <laughs> amazing like oh, God, i've been doing doing judo extensively for like six seven years it's competed a couple of times and it's still just like yeah yeah well, you know, the, the funny thing about that is, is, uh, is everything comes full circle, you know? So I've been doing jujitsu now for over 20 years, started in my twenties and now I'm 48. Right. Um, and, uh, and you go through phases and everything comes, everything goes full circle. When people ask me now about my jujitsu, like when they watch me roll, my students watch me roll here, they ask me about my jujitsu. Like my game is very, very, it's a white belt game of jujitsu, man. 
I play a white belt game of jujitsu and, and um, I'm just, uh, I'm just a little better at it now than I was, you know? Um, but, um, but, but yeah, it's just a very, very white belt game of jujitsu. Like, you know, I, I go from, if I'm in somebody's guard and obviously my first goal is to break their guard open. And then I step over and I put myself in half guard and then I control and stay safe and healthy half guard, keep the pressure until I can pass their guard. But it's a very, very, um, very basic game. And the reason why that's happened is because as I've gotten older, um, you know, uh, you do this long enough, like you train, you train, you teach long enough, you know, every year you get older, but your students stay the same age. Right. So every day you, every year you get older, your students stay the same age. And so as I've gotten older, you know, I'm not as strong as I used to be. I'm not as fast as I used to be. I'm not as athletic as I used to be. And then I realized that fundamentals like basic jujitsu is what rules the day as you get older. It's fun when you're, it's fun when you're still younger and you have the athleticism, the strength and everything else. It's fun to do the great stuff, the crazy stuff, right? You know, the, the, the standing guard passes, the barambolos, it's, it's fun. That's all great. But man, once you turn, you know, once you get in your, your forties, man, trying to invert isn't as easy as it used to be. And so, you know, so you start throwing those things out the window. Um, and then, and then you have to sit there and assess. So one day you, you do a self-assessment and say, okay, what am I still capable of doing? Freaking basics, man. Basics. That's what I'm still capable of doing. And, uh, and yeah, so it, it all comes full circle, man. So tell us, man, where did it all begin? How did you get into martial arts? How, when did you start training? Sir, um, so, I mean, I've always been like a martial arts nerd, right? Like I started, I started Okinawan karate when I was like six years old, you know? And so, you know, I did the kids martial arts stuff. Um, and then, um, and then, so martial arts has always been close to me, you know, um, even when I joined, when I joined the military, I went off, I joined the military. Um, I tried to train any, anywhere that I could. So like when I was in, uh, when I was down at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, I found a hop keto place. So I did hop keto. I just took whatever there was, whatever I could get my hands on. And then finally, when I settled in Albuquerque, um, uh, I wanted to get serious about martial arts again. And I found Greg Jackson's gym. It was just called Jackson Sky Jiu-Jitsu at the time. And, and it was just a little, little gym off San Mateo place. Um, probably about 800 square feet. And, um, and uh, I went in there one day. Why well, I, I take that back. Let's rewind a second. One of the guys I was working with is an old boxing, an old boxer and boxing trainer. So I started boxing with him. Um, um, but I knew about jujitsu and I wanted to learn grappling. There was just nowhere to learn at the time. And then, uh, um, and then one day I found, I found Jackson's and I went in there and uh, I saw these guys grappling. And so I got on the mat with them and, and, and got worked over quite a bit. And I said, man, this is the place for me. Like, I got to, I got to, you know, I got to train here. And Greg is just an amazing coach and, and just the nicest person you could ever meet. Um, and so I, uh, that's where I started my grappling was, was under Greg Jackson. How, how long did you train at Jackson? How many years? I was, I was with him about, I was probably with him probably three years, I guess. Yeah, about three, four, yeah, about three years, I guess. And then that's where I met Alberto Crane. Um, and then I'll borrow, uh, you know, um, I, uh, I was training at, I was training at Jackson's and then I actually got sent out here to LA to go to the, uh, the Gracie Academy here in Torrance to go through one of their programs. So work paid for me to go through one of their programs. So I came out here, um, and, uh, spent a couple of weeks out here in Torrance with Horian and, uh, they, um, in our class, like Horian could tell that I had done something, like I knew a little bit of grappling. And so he invited me to his night classes, his jujitsu classes. So that was the first time I ever did jujitsu in a gi was at the the, uh, the original Torrance Academy down here. Whoa. So he put me in a gi, he put me in a gi and man, I loved it, you know, I loved it. Then I got back to, uh, I got back to Albuquerque and there was no place to train jujitsu there. But, um, but uh, Alberta Crane started coming in to train uh, mm -hmm at Jackson's for his MMA fights. And somebody said, Hey, like, that's a, that's a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu guy, man. Like he lives up in Santa Fe, he just opened an Academy, you know, he used to live in Brazil. And so uh, I hit up Alberto and he said, yeah, come up, you know, come up Saturday mornings, train with me. And so, um, so I started doing both driving up to Santa Fe, training at Jackson's driving up to Santa Fe. Um, and, uh, and yeah. And then uh, um, decided to make the full-time switch to, to, to Jiu Jitsu. Right. So, so made the full-time switch and started training under Alberto full-time. 
So. Yeah. How far? How far is it for, uh, from Albuquerque to Santa Fe? Drive time. Mm, about an hour. Yeah, that's. I knew. I knew it was somewhat close proximity. So, like yeah. from here to Fort Smith, Arkansas. Right, that's about yeah, yeah. About, about an hour for me to get to Fort Smith. Which you yeah. owned a, a gym in Fort Smith at one time. Is that when? When yeah. did that? When? When was that era? Uh, two thousand six. I was teaching out of. Uh, I was teaching out of a small um, uh, karate dojo there in two thousand six, and I officially opened my gym in two thousand seven. I I started off splitting it, you know, teaching at a karate dojo and then ended up getting a ton of students and eventually opening my first location. Yeah. Yeah. I was a purple, I was a purple belt at the time. And, um, I had just moved over to Fort Smith and, um, uh, I called back to Alberto. I called back to Alberto and said, man, there's, there's no place to train here, man. You know, um, uh, no, I like jujitsu, like, you know, the closest jujitsu was either Oklahoma city West or East was, was little rock, but they were both three hours away from Fort Smith, you know? So I was like, man, there's really nowhere to train here. And, uh, and Alberto, you know, Alberto was always very encouraging. He said, look, man, like you're a purple belt. Like you, 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 you can train your own partners, man. You know, you know, you can, you can train people, you can teach people. So I started teaching people and, um, and, uh, and then, yeah, and then, then I decided to open up a school and, and that's how I started in Fort Smith. Yeah, I mean, you. I was a purple belt when you taught that seminar, and yeah, and, yeah, mm-hmm. and had a a school. I mean, I don't. We probably had over a hundred students at the time, and all of our young know, kids and everything. But yeah, um, yeah that's uh, yeah. So you were you were in Fort Smith. This like is a part. Like, is it your military career that brought brought you to Fort Smith? Um, no, no, no. I, it wasn't. I, I worked for the government. I worked for the government. And so I was doing okay, some work okay. out on Port Chaffee out there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. In the government career. Yes. I guess it's the, yeah. Uh, so yeah. Cause I didn't know, um, you know, I, I like missed out on when you were here. Uh, I mean, that's like, I was, I don't know. I was probably, when did you, what years did you say that you had your Fort Smith gym open? 2000, um, 2006, end of 2006, 2007, eight, nine, 10 i guess i left in 2010 2011 somewhere on that that's right yeah. i was like getting going with my uh first location you know like yeah uh, 2000 mm-hmm. well, 2012 is when i made that transition and opened my my own club but uh you know it i've been training with caleb from about 06 about what time but you know i i just heard like heard about you by the time I was getting to be like a blue belt and stuff. And then um, I don't even remember, like, I feel like I'd, uh, I, I'd met you. Oh yeah. I guess you taught at the black belt conference that Caleb. I did. Yeah. 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 That the first, I think the, the I first one, I think. Yeah. 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 Those, uh, yeah, those, those are always fun, man. That was, I remember you showing like a deep half detail that we were, reminiscing about too that the one where you don't get put in the triangle where you come back up on that sweep oh like, yeah, yeah, yeah we had like a side yeah. conversation about that like me and you and nate murdoch and um i can't remember i guess i get you know jeff woods might have been there he was the uh one of the guys here that uh was was at that event <clears throat> so yeah yeah it's crazy how that's grown right <sighs> it, it man it, it is like it's crazy how that's somewhere? grown uh, it, <laughs> It is mind blowing because, uh, you know, when I was a blue belt, I mean, I like to say this sometimes, like Caleb Plank used to be the only blue belt I knew, like, but and he was, dude. <laughs> right, 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 like, right. It was like, it used to be kind of like exotic, you know, I mean, right. I guess to some people it still is, but like, I'm talking in the state, like there was, and then it's been now, I don't, I can't, I remember there were five total black belts in Arkansas, like when right. I, when I got my blue belt. And now, like, there's a countless number. Like, there's a well oh, yeah. 50, you know what I mean? But, I mean, that's yeah. not even a lot. But I would I would estimate that it's part, we're probably uh, close to 100 now. Just, like, I, I mean, I'm like, oh, there's a, this gym has, like, Westside has a ton. Uh, yeah. We have, we promoted our first five. And <clears throat> people that have been with me this whole time since I first got going, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that stuck it out that been around so uh or even before like because uh like 
several of them were with me all the way back at the karate gym. Down. Right, right, right. Wow. Still here, man. <clears throat> so, yeah, that's uh, that's awesome, man. Um, so did you guys have any like uh, craziness get close to you other than COVID with like riots, protests, broken glass? I know that that one tenth planet location got burned to the ground. Was that did did you see yeah. like that or fires, anything like that come close to? Uh, I mean, they were here in Los Angeles for sure, but um, um, close is a um. Cl- LA is really weird. Close, close is a, a, a strange term, right? Because um, uh, here in LA, like we measure, we measure distance by time, not by actual distance, you know? So, um, so, so there was some stuff relatively close, but nothing that, 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 that put our gym or anything in any danger, you know? Um, uh, this was a little different than the, than the, than the first riot. See, I was here in LA during the first riots, you know? Um, and in my opinion, the, these, these riots here were, were nowhere near as bad as it was in 92. Um, the big difference is, uh, the big difference is they, the, the looting and the rioting here, uh, just this past year took place in the more affluent parts of Los Angeles. So people came out of where they lived and went to the nicer areas to, you know, Santa Monica, Beverly Hills to root uh, or to loot and riot and all that stuff where, where back in 92, it was happening in, in the neighborhoods, in, in the, 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 how should I say that the troubled neighborhoods themselves. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm, I'm here in like, LA has changed too. LA has changed in, since 92 and 92 LA was, people were flocking out of LA because inside the city, the city was so bad. There wasn't a neighborhood in LA that wasn't crime ridden back in 92. Um, It's the exact opposite. Now LA has become pretty posh uh, in the city. I mean, people live downtown, they work downtown. So uh, LA proper, the city has actually become pretty posh and it's kind of pushed everybody to the outside. And so, um, so now when I say they came, they, they came from the outside into riot, in the nicer neighborhoods this time around, whereas before it was, it was just right here in the city. So, yeah. Man, uh, yeah, yeah, a a couple, I mean, Jack is, he lives, uh, he did live in Irvine. I think that he lives in LA right now, Um, but he's talking about moving out um, to like Salt Lake City. He's got family there. Uh, Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and that's, you know, I do know some people that have been moving out of California, out of New Jersey, New York. Um, have you been seeing a lot of that? Like uh, a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people. Yeah. A good friend, uh, a good friend uh, of mine, the guy I used to train, train down here and I used to see it all the tournaments, but, um, Greg, a guy named Greg Hamilton, he's now over in Texas. He's, he's with, uh, he got his black belt from Jean Jacques, but he's now over with, uh, with Carlos Machado. And so he has a school out there in uh, in uh, Dallas, or one of the suburbs of Dallas. He's doing really well out there, but a lot of people are moving out of LA. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. So back in the good old days before the pandemic, um, <laughs> what was it? What what were the you know what was the jujitsu culture like around you? Like what what are some things that you think make it special or different or i mean because for me it's always been kind of exotic and yeah i could go on about well, my, uh, but. so i mean southern california other than outside of brazil southern california is kind of like the mecca right like huh. um you know i mean it is it is and there's so many schools out here um and uh and, and again prior to this pandemic um uh, during the season, the jujitsu season, you know, so starts, starts with usually, uh, usually there's a couple tournaments come January, but the season usually kicks off March with the pens, you know, and then, uh, then we run through the summer all the way to masters, masters worlds. That, that's kind of the, uh, that was kind of the season. Um, uh, man, you can compete every weekend down here. There's so many different types of tournaments. Like, you know, we have NABJJF, um, and then we have, of course, the IBJJF tournaments. And then we have, we had, uh, you know, for a time, we had a bunch of smaller productions that were doing some really good things, man. Some really awesome um, uh, sub only, no time limit, like true sub only, no, no time limit tournaments. 
Um, uh, there was a uh, there was an organization down here, a guy named Sean. He was running an organization down here called Dream, and they would do uh, they would do like the baddest blue belt and the baddest purple belt, and they were lit. They were truly. I, I had one of my students fighting. Why well, I, I always had students fighting his tournaments, but like the baddest blue belt tournament was truly uh, submission only, no time limit. And so, like you would start a match. I kid you not. Like you would start a match, watch like ten minutes of the match, and then say, hey, let's go get something to eat, go out, sit down, go to lunch, come back, and those guys would still be fighting. I mean, matches would go an hour, an hour and 20 minutes, like just absolutely nuts. But, um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, but those, those, the guys that won those tournaments, like that's a true test, man. Like that's a, that's a true test. Yeah. Is getting in there and a true no submission, or I'm sorry, no time limit sub only, winning a no time limit sub only tournament is a true test of, of, uh, of your, your skill. That's for sure. Yeah. Man, you guys can just go get acai bowls anytime you want in California. Oh yeah. Yeah. All over, all over, <laughs> uh, all over. My professor, Alberto Crane, man, he owns a, he owns a great, uh, him and his wife have, uh, um, uh, acai jungle cafe in Burbank. It's attached to their gym and they have wonderful food, man. Their acai bowls are amazing and wonderful food. They have a wonderful menu and a little cafe and, and yeah, so you can get acai just about anywhere here. Yeah, amazing. So, yeah, yeah, man. It it is uh, that is a great way to describe it. It's it is kind of the mecca. It's where it's where worlds and pans have been. Um, yep. You know, and uh, some some great gems like what you've got the the Mendez brothers. Is it Galvao's in San Diego? But I mean, he's still. in San Diego. It's all still. It's all still. Yeah. You know, San Diego is. San Diego isn't too far away and, and, you know, it's not at any of the, any of the tournaments here, it's not uncommon to see, you know, Otto's guys come up from San Diego. And then of course, AOJ, you know, uh, Mendez brothers over there in Costa Mesa, um, everybody, Cobrina right down the road here on Wilshire, yeah. um, you know, uh, Humboldt Bajau right over here in the Valley. Um, and so, so some of the top gyms and, and top players are all out here, you know, and it's kind of cool because you get to see them compete at every level. You know, we get to see them. Like, we get to see them in the smaller tournaments when they're some of the competitors that are at the smaller tournaments when they're uh, they're prepping for the pans or prepping for worlds. You know, so it, it's it's a uh, um, it's uh, 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 for the jujitsu guy. Like it, it, it doesn't get a whole lot better, you know, than living yeah. in Southern California. Last time I was in uh, that area for worlds, I. I went and trained at Shootbox Long Beach. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the owner, Jer uh, Garrison, he had taught a seminar at Caleb's because his in-laws live in Northwest Arkansas. Uh, like they had oh, no kidding. or something. Yeah. So like yeah. I, he, he, you know, he was super nice. I learned a lot from him. I still use some techniques I learned at that seminar today and teach, you know. So right. uh, I hit him up and they had, um, they had a black belt there that was a, uh, uh, a guy that Kluber or Clubber was, was that guy's coach. Like he had oh, okay. a, uh, that guy's patch on. I remember, I can't yeah. remember his name though, but he was teaching. Clever, Clever, Clever teach Luciano. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He was a clever guy. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I want to I want to say his name was like Marcelo or something, but I, I could be wrong. I would have to look back into it, but I did, I did his class and, there rolled Eric Ingram and I were were together. We'd like we were walking distance with our Airbnb. So we went in there, we rolled, kind of trained, but there was people there uh from all over. Like, all over. Yeah. We're just here, you know, you, your hotel and you sit in the hot tub or the pool. Like people are in from all over and they go train at these yeah, yeah. at these gyms. I mean, that's I mean, we we went and trained at your gym one time when we were yeah. uh, a bunch of us were in town. Yeah, it's not uncommon, especially around the big, you know, around the, the time of the big tournaments to get calls and say, hey, we're just in town for pans, but we're looking for a place to roll and uh, warm up a little bit. You know, do you mind if we jump in a class or come train? Like, yeah, come on down, man. So it's pretty cool in that, that, that aspect, too. We got tons of visitors out here from all over. So, yeah. yeah. So, you know, there is like, I have to think about all the people we just named, Cobrina, the Mendez, all of that, all that, right? And, and everything, everything else, there's, there's um, a lot of jujitsu, a lot of academies, a lot of gyms, a lot of people that are, uh, I'm sure that are, you know, 
not these well-known names that have gym, very successful gyms. Oh, yeah, too. yeah, of course, um, of course. So in in that um, market where you're at with with all this, yeah. you, like what are some things that, about what how you do things, like your culture, your, your the way your academy is, that that make you guys uh, able to do things like survive COVID and grow and et cetera? Yeah, um, you know, there, there, there are a couple different things. I know when, uh, when I, um, when I decided to punch out, when I decided to leave the government and come here to LA and, you know, all my buddies and everybody's asking me, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go teach you full time. And they're like, dude, you're going to go open up a school in Los Angeles. I'm like, are you kidding me? Cause I mean, again, everybody's out here, you know? And, uh, and, uh, I said, yeah, I mean, I, but I really wanted to do it. So I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a go and we'll see what happens. And you come out here. And you learn. There's a couple things. Um, uh, one, one of the, one of the, one of the blessings out here is again, like I said, we 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 measure we measure distance by time, not by actual distance. And so, um, and so, because it is so difficult to get around here, there's enough there's enough room for for all of us. You know what I mean? So you may move to you may move to LA with the intention. So you may move to the city of Los Angeles, right? Like if if you don't know Los Angeles area. If you don't know the LA area, you go, uh, you go, you know, I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to train with, uh, with, um, with the Mendez brothers. And then, so you jump on a plane, you move here to LA, you get settled in and you look on a map and you go, oh, Costa Mesa is only 20 miles away. That's nothing. 20 miles in Arkansas is what you need 20 miles in 15 minutes, 15 right? minutes, dude, but yeah, it's, it's going to take you two and a half hours here. You know what I mean? And so it may be great. It may be great to what's it called. It may be great to, uh, you know, your first couple times you go down there and you think, man, this is awesome. But come two months down the road, three months down the road, you start looking for a place to closer to home, you know. And so um, and so that that works in our favor. That works in my favor here. But I think also the other thing, too, is understanding, like knowing your audience and understanding your crowd and, and, and carving out your niche. And what I mean by that is like I'm surrounded. Cobrina is Cobrina is not even 10 minutes down the road from me. I mean, that's literally 10 minutes down the road from me. Um, my professor, Alberto, is, is maybe about half an hour from me. Um, uh, uh, who else is that? I mean, there's just, there's just a, a bunch of people around here. Um, uh, Hollywood BJJ is not too far. They're about 15 minutes from me. Um, uh, and, and so carving out your niche. And so, like, if people come in here, if I get a purple belt that comes in here, man, and he, let's say he just moved here and he's a purple belt and he really wants to be a great competitor, right? He wants to be world champion. I have no problem saying, hey, buddy, go right down the road. Cobrini is right down the road, man. He's got a great school. The guy's going to make you purple belt world champion. Go right. I have no problem doing that. Um, I, 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 as far as carving out my niche, um, I feel like I can, and I think my students here will agree, um, I, uh, I can take you from knowing zero jujitsu to being a really, really solid purple belt. And I'm fine with that. I am absolutely fine with that. And once you make purple belt, if it's in your heart and you say, hey, man, I want to be a world champion, I want to be pan champion, I want to be world champion, I have no problem saying, hey, man, go down to Cobrina, go down to Alberto's, go down to, to whatever, because that's where you're going to find the level of, com of, uh, of training partners that you're going to need to, to reach that goal. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're if you're if you're a guy down the road who uh, who who wants to learn jujitsu for self defense or get in shape or or for whatever reason have no aspirations of of being the world champion you just want to um, you know you just want to get in the culture learn martial arts and whatnot um, um, uh, this this is the place to do it man. This is the place to do it. I'll take you, you from again knowing nothing to being a solid purple. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I can take you from I can take you from knowing nothing to being a solid black belt. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, if you're that competitor, if you're that, I have no problem when I get guys to that level and they want to do the extra. I have no problem saying, "Hey, this is where you need to go now." You know, and so yeah. Well, and it may be different in Southern California, but I would say for, I was saying that while you're talking about like the difference in sport and hobby and self-defense and all the other reasons people to stay in shape, fitness, do people want to do jujitsu? It's like, 
I would say that you probably, let's say you do encounter that exact scenario you just talked about. It would, it's such a small percentage of people in relation sure, to all sure. of those other demographics of people that are just coming in because, and they want to gain some confidence and defend, be able to defend themselves and be a part of a community, et cetera. You know, I mean, all of the right. benefits that come with being a part of the judicial community, but, right. uh, you know, most of my members don't compete. I right, mean, right, right. you know, I've had 32 students compete at a tournament, uh, at an right. ATF, you know, uh, I was competing at the time. And I would say also, I've noted that if, since I start to compete less, I have students competing less. Right, right, right. right. It's less a part of like the, um, most obvious culture that we have going, you know, it's like, it's still a component. We still do it. It's about like what's right. for sure. So, but uh, yeah, so um, I got, I got a topic for, uh, for us to riff on real quick uh, here from Mike page. Uh, so we'll give a shout out to Mikey. Yeah. Uh, Mike. Yeah. I just talked to him on the phone right before, right before I sat down with you. But he, and I will say like, uh, I've been noticing like, dude, you're staying super active. You said on Facebook, not to throw you, throw your, your personal info out there, but you're 48 years old. Mike was like, how's that dude, you know, asking this, how's he still do it? Like, cause you're going rocky and you're riding your bike, like all over California, Southern California, you know, I, yeah. I think I saw you do a 20 mile ride the other day. I mean, you are really active, you know, and how do you continue to find that motivation? You know, so for myself, you know, I'm 15 I, years down the road. I have, I have severe ADHD, man. <laughs> I do. I do. I, I wasn't diagnosed until I was an adult. I wasn't diagnosed with it until I was 38 years old. Um, I, 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 uh, you know, I had been active my whole life, right? So, um, again, when I was young, I, I did martial arts, I played sports. Um, and then I went in the military and I was active in the military. Then I left the military and went to work for the government. I was active uh, for the government. And so for, so for 38 years of my life, I had been relatively active, right? I, I had an outlet for, for this energy that I had. Um, um, and then, uh, and then at 38, when I moved back to Albuquerque, I took a desk job in Albuquerque. Um, and uh, and uh, about six months into that desk job, I just couldn't function. I didn't know what was wrong with me. Um, I, just, I just could not function. And, and again, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And that led to a little bit of depression. Um, and so I ended, up, uh, I ended up going to see a doctor. Um, and then after about uh, six months of evaluation, um, they came back and they said, Hey man, like, have, has anybody ever told you that you have a uh, severe, um, ADD adult ADD? And I said, no, nobody's ever told me that, you know? So, um, they had actually put me on medication for it. So they put me on medication for it. And I remember that was a trip. My first day back at work on medication was like, uh, um, no, oh, geez. Uh, <sighs> there was that movie that came out, um, yeah, What's that? Limitless. Yes. Maybe, That's maybe. what it felt like. That's what it felt like. Like I remember sitting at my desk, focused, ready to work and, and knocking stuff out and thinking, man, is this what it's like to be normal? Cause this is freaking amazing, you know? Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah. So, uh, um, eventually I decided to leave that job. Um, and when I did, uh, uh, the doctors decided, well, since we're going back and we're going to be doing jujitsu full time, where they can start weaning me off my medication. So I started coming off the medication. I haven't been on any meds since 2013. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I think that's it, man. I think it's just, um, I, I'm all over the place all the time. Like I, I'll, I'll throw my ruck on my back and I'll ruck 20 miles. I'll ruck from my house out to the beach. And then the next weekend I'll jump on my bike and I'll, you know, I'll ride 20, 30 miles and, and that's it. And then every day I'm here, you know, teaching. So, yeah. and on the mat, so. Yeah, man, just getting to do your passions is such a great outlet for anything, for anyone. You know what I'm saying? Like it is, uh, yeah, me uh, teaching history, doing this podcast, the gym, 
uh, playing guitar, like it, everything that I've like made my life just kind of all be about. It yeah. still gets stressful sometimes, um, balancing all of it. But uh, man, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's a blessing, brother. It's a blessing. Don't, 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 don't ever fail to recognize that it's definitely a blessing. You know, um, I, uh, I, I, I tell this story all the time. But I, I, when, when I was working in an office in Albuquerque, we had a security guard that worked the front gate. Um, really nice guy, right? Older guy. Um, and his name was Jack. And, and I used to stop and talk to him every morning and stop and talk to him on my way in. And uh, he'd drink coffee and we'd talk. And then I'd go in the office and I'd do my thing on the way back out. I'd stop and talk to him. Well, then I later found out that he worked for, uh, he was a retired New Mexico State police guy. And um, so as he was retired New Mexico State police, and he had a couple, a couple of legendary capers under his belt, you know. So I stopped and I asked him, I said, hey, man, I said, I got to ask you a question, Jack. Like, what are you doing here, man? What are you doing here? You know? And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I know you're retired from the state police. So I know you've got a good retirement. Like, what are you doing here working as a security guard? You know? Um, and he said, uh, he, he totally changed my way of thinking. He said, uh, he said, well, I'll tell you what, Mark. He said, I come here because um, guys like you, every morning you come in, you stop, you talk to me. I have a good conversation with you guys. I like being around you guys. He said, but uh, he said, I did retire. He said, I retired and I had all these plans just like everybody else. I was going to work hard. I was going to save up, um, uh, stay with New Mexico State Police. So I had a good pension. And when I retired, my wife and I were going to do all these things. So he finally retired from the New Mexico State Police. His wife got sick and passed away. So he had nobody, you know, and uh, and he said, so now I come to work. To, to hang out with you guys. Um, he said, but we have it all wrong, man. He said, uh, he said, we work so hard our entire life and we plan on doing these things at the end. And they net for the most of us, they never pan out. He said, so, so live life while you're young. And then when you get my age, go find a fuck, go find a job because you can't do anything else. When you get my age, there's nothing else to do. So go find a job. He said, but until you get my age, live life, man. Do what you want and live life. Um, he said, because even at his age, when he's retired, sure, he could travel the world. But he, in the back of his head, he'd always be thinking, what if I had done this when I was 30 years old mm -hmm. instead of 70? You know, how much of a better experience would it have been? You know, so sure. that was actually the catalyst for me. That was actually the catalyst for me. I had 20 years with the federal government, Brian. I had 20 years with the government. And that, that was the catalyst for me. I walked in one day and I said, I'm done. Turned in my two weeks notice. And I said, I'm going to go teach jujitsu full time because that's what I want to do. That's what I love to do. So. So, yeah, here we are. You know, so, so, yeah, so, so it's a blessing every day. Every day you, you get to do something that you love, something you're passionate about. It's a blessing, man. So. It is. It certainly is, man. I've. I mean, just like this, this connection with just how I, you and I met, like there's so many of those that exist through the martial arts, you know, it's the, the relationship right. form, the, the experiences traveling to compete and so on. Uh, they're amazing. I hope you froze up a little bit. You still there? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm here. I'm here. Well, all right, I'm here. You got me, Brian? Yeah, yeah. I think we're caught okay, back with the way, but I think we're good. Yeah. No, I, you're absolutely right, man. And those relationships that you build, the people that you meet, the relationships you build are are, are also are also priceless, you know. So the relationship that I've been able to keep with you guys like you and, and, and Caleb, Caleb, I love Caleb and Mike to death, you know. Yeah. Um uh, so relationships like that are like I said, they're priceless. So they are, man. They are. Well, hey, man, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me. It's been it's been really good talking to you. Um, let's go ahead and wrap it up. And man, maybe, uh, I, I, you know, I'm sure I will see, either see you around or maybe we'll do another podcast one day, one way or the other. Oh, yeah, I plan on getting out there to Arkansas again sometime. You know, my wife's from Oklahoma. And there so we need to go back. We need to go back at some point. And, if you uh, ever had it back this way, let me know. Maybe we could sneak a, a seminar in or something like that. Okay. I'm always um, down for something impromptu like that. And we've had we, Flavio came, uh, Kenneth came in 
and just did this impromptu seminar. We canceled class that night or just was like class. Oh, awesome. You know, like just yeah. do obvious here. Like this is what we're doing tonight, you know? Yeah. So if you are, do find yourself headed this way or, um, you know, uh, definitely let me know. Cause, uh, you know, it'd be great. It'd be great seeing you catching up, et cetera. Yeah. Awesome. We'll do. All right, man. Have a great day. Thanks. Okay, Brian, you take care. See ya. Bye-bye now.